Well, hello there, so-called internet. Oh, it's, it's over there. It's over there. Oh, okay. Well, hello there, so-called internet. <laughs> I had an idea. Yes, yes, yes. You see, vermin tied to to COVID nineteen. Na- na- where was I? Oh, yes, COVID nineteen. Ver- vermin type two. Ver- two divided by nineteen. 10. Top 10. Top 10 COVID-19 tips. Vermintide 2. Top 10 Vermintide tips. Where was I? Where was I? Wait. Top 10 Vermintide tips. Anyways, guys, welcome to uh, the first edition of uh, Vermintide Top Tip Series. I think it's going to be the first of a three-part series. Now, this is the basics edition, but the explanations are by no means basic. I'm pretty sure even if you're a seasoned veteran, there's at least one or two tips in here that's uh, that's for you. But this episode in particular is focused on uh, newer players explaining some base mechanics that aren't really, you know, shed much light on if you were just playing the game. This video took ages to make. I hope you guys enjoy it. And there'll be two more editions. One featuring little known facts about different weapons, different weapon mechanics that are hidden and aren't mentioned in game. And I think I'll do a part three about uh, blocking, about defensive explanations. Again, mechanic wise, talking about the different things that the game just doesn't tell you. So uh, anyways, I hope you guys enjoy and I'll see you at the end. First up, we got unlisted passive buffs that aren't mentioned anywhere in the game. Now heroes have a base critical hit chance of 5%, but both Shade and the Witch Hunter Captain both have an unlisted passive buff of plus 5% critical hit chance for a total of 10%, which with item properties can be turned into 20%, plus any additional modifiers from either talents, abilities, or the weapon sequence itself. The Witch Hunter Captain also has a plus 25% headshot power passive, and lastly there's the Handmaiden who has an extra plus 1 stamina buff. Moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about stamina. Now, each undamaged shield represents a total of two stamina, whilst the broken shield represents a total of one stamina. And without any modifiers, your base stamina regeneration rate is roughly speaking two stamina or one shield per second. But a lesser known fact is that the time window between the consumption of stamina and the regeneration of stamina varies depending on what consumed it, and even the weapon you're using. Now, for most weapons, there's a 1.5 second window after consumption from a push before you start regenerating. However, for shielded weapons with the exception of Kirillian Spear and Shield, that window is only 0.75 seconds. That is, unless we're talking about blocking, in which case stamina regeneration starts 1.0 seconds after consumption from blocking an attack. That is, of course, unless your block is broken, which for those of you who aren't familiar is the technical term for reaching zero stamina due to blocking an attack, in which case the window is doubled, taking a total of two seconds from the consumption of a block until you'll start regenerating stamina. And an absolutely key thing to notice here is that increasing your stamina recovery, which is a property you can put on your trinket, affects both the speed at which it regenerates, as well as reducing the recovery time of these windows by the exact same percentage amount. Which brings us to our third tip regarding archers. What to do about them? I mean, they're annoying as hell, and even though their accuracy isn't always on point, there's usually a lot more than one, and once you collect enough of them, they will chip away at your health in the most annoying way. Not to mention the fact that it's extremely impractical to take them out individually with most ranged weapons, but you can in fact block their attacks, albeit only from the front within your effective block angle. But knowing this can still absolutely save your life, although I do admit that it doesn't exactly work when there's 10 of them and you're completely surrounded and they're shooting you from all different sides and you haven't even spotted half of them and ah! I know, I know. Fuck archers. It is worth mentioning though that you can also dodge their attacks, but again, that doesn't really help when, you know, 10 of them surrounded, ah, all that stuff. Up next, we're gonna talk about stagger. Now, I wasn't originally planning to talk about this in this video, but there seems to still be a great deal of confusion about it, so, well, here we are. Now, when we're talking about stagger, we're really talking about two completely separate mechanics, stagger count and actual stagger. The first of which I'll be explaining right here right now, and the second of which will be included in the next slightly more advanced video. 
But as for stack or count, here's what you need to know. In a nutshell, by default, all enemies will start out with a stacker count equal to zero and will broadly speaking receive a plus one to its stacker count every time you perform a light attack or a push from outside the effective angle and plus two to its stacker count every time you perform a heavy attack or a push from inside the effective push angle and will drop right back down to zero after only a couple of seconds of being left alone. With the exception of all five bosses such as Minotaurs or Rat Ogres, all of which have a stagger resistance of 100, which is just a fancy way of saying that they're unstaggerable. But with those caveats out of the way, now that we know how to add stagger count and how it deteriorates, let's talk about damage and how the different level 15 stagger talents affect it, starting out with ranged weapons since they're the simplest. Now, regardless of what talents you have, it doesn't matter. Cause as it relates to the stagger count, a ranged attack will always deal 20% extra damage on stagger count 0 and 1 and 40% extra damage on stagger count equals 2. Now it's true that enhanced power does increase the damage of your ranged attack because it is a raw power buff, but that's completely separate from the matter of stagger count and none of the other stagger talents affect ranged damage at all whatsoever. And I should also mention that damage over time effects neither adds to the stagger count or benefits from it. But let's move on to melee damage and more specifically to the talent smiter. Now the first target your weapon encounters has an identical damage buff profile as it relates to stack account compared to ranged attacks. Whilst any additional targets your weapon hits in the same swing receives an equivalent and identical damage modifier to that of having no stack or talents at all. Moving on, we got the talent mainstay, which works exactly like the default stagger modifier, except instead of 20% at stagger count 1 and 40 at stagger count 2, you instead receive 40% at stagger count 1 and 60% at stagger count 2, stagger count 0 still being 0. And this modifier affects all minions equally, regardless of how many enemies you cleave through. Moving on, we got my own personal favorite that I pretty much select on every hero where it's possible, it is of course Assassin. Now whenever you attack an enemy and it's neither a critical hit or a headshot, it has identical and equivalent damage modifiers to that of having no talent at all, just like additional targets when using Smiter. However with Assassin, any minion that you critical hit or headshot will immediately act as if it has stacker count equals 2, in other words a plus 40% bonus. Which, just to be clear, doesn't stack with itself when you critical headshot or with the default 20 and 40% bonus from stacker counts 1 and 2 since it's essentially replacing them. It does, however, provide a hero like Shade with 40% extra damage to her ultimate versus bosses despite their stacker resistance since the damage modifier in this case isn't predicated upon the stacker count but rather on critical hits and headshots and as it so happens, Shade's ulti is a guaranteed critical hit. Last but not least, we got Bulwark, which as far as stacker count is concerned, functions exactly like having no stacker talent at all, except whenever you do stacker an enemy minion, you also apply a debuff, which increases the amount of damage the enemy minion takes from melee sources by 10%, that lasts for 2 seconds and stacks multiplicatively with the default stacker damage bonuses, and also benefits your teammates. Moving on from one dummy to another, I think it's safe to assume you already realize there are dummies in the keep, which can be used to test your damage output as well as practicing your attack sequences. But did you also know that keep dummies have both an armor class and a faction? The one is Skaven Armored and the other is Chaos Infantry. And the damage numbers will reflect that. Also a really useful thing to know is that without external modifiers such as crit power or headshot damage, any and all weapons critical hit damage to the body of an enemy is identical and equivalent to that same weapons and same attacks non-critical headshot. Do note that a critical headshot is not necessarily equivalent to just adding the bonus damage of a critical hit and a headshot together with the base damage. Lastly, you should know that both crit power and headshot damage as modifiers provide a damage boost that's calculated not on the basis of the total damage dealt of let's say a critical hit, but rather the difference between a non-critical hit and a critical hit, non-headshot and headshot. Moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about consumables. More specifically, we're going to talk about healing. Now, healing droughts always heal you for exactly 75 HP. 
whilst medical supplies will always heal the receiver for 80% of their missing health, the calculation of which will round up to the closest full number, regardless of how much that is. This unfortunately also means that the effectiveness of a medkit as it relates to health replenished is reduced significantly by incremental reductions to your overall health pool, most commonly from the curse you get from holding a Grimoire of Power. Both of them will however override temporary HP up to the healed amount as well as resetting your death counter by making you healthy. Do note that although this wasn't always the case in the current patch, using a medkit to heal one of your teammates regardless of talents and properties, will now also make you healthy and thus reset your death counter as well, even though you don't receive any health. And while we're on the topic of health, let's talk a little bit about the temporary variety. Now, after receiving health or temporary health from any source except Natural Bond, Waystalker's Passive or the Grail Knight's Health Regen Quest, there's an exact 3 second delay before it starts decaying, the rate of which is equal to 1 health per second. Now one really important thing about temporary health that isn't mentioned anywhere in the game and that only a crazy person would extrapolate for themselves is that increasing your hero's healing received doesn't just increase the amount of health you would replenish from let's say a healing pot, but also increases the amount of temporary HP you generate based off of your level 5 talent by the exact same percentage amount, which makes this property way more valuable. And it's one of those things I really wish the game would have told me, as I intentionally avoided this property for quite some time, which made it even less likely that I was going to discover this for myself. Up next, we're going to talk a little bit about hero power. Now, your hero's power affects both the cleave limit, stagger strength, base damage and armor damage of any given attack, both melee and ranged, but it also includes much less obvious things, such as an increased damage to both fire and explosive bombs, increased damage and stagger to your career ability, and probably the least obvious of them all is that it also increases the damage of explosive barrels, although not fire barrels, and the game will use the power of whomever hit the final trigger in order to calculate the total damage. Another key thing to note about power is that any raw power buff, such as a strength pot, will affect all of the same previously aforementioned things for the full duration of the buff, but it will also stack multiplicatively with any additional raw power buffs you might have on top, increasing the value and total power provided by each buff. This effect increases significantly in strength for each separate power buff you hold simultaneously, and is the reason for why a strength pot that gave me 1650 extra damage and a passive ability that on its own gave me 625 damage will in fact, like shown in the example here, combine to give me plus 2725 damage, despite the fact that each of the buffs on their own would only combine for a total bonus of 2275 damage. Power versus properties from items, however, will always stack additively with each other before being combined with your hero power. For a combined total power versus value against a specific enemy minion's type, for which this number will serve as your base in the damage calculations, as I've showcased in the example versus chaos warriors on the top of the screen. And in case you were wondering, that was totally intentional. <clears throat> Moving on, I want to talk a little bit about damage reduction. Now, I did briefly mention this in my patch update video, but there wasn't really enough time to cover the subject in a manner that would do it justice. So apologies for repeating myself, but as of patch 3.1, damage reduction now stacks with itself multiplicatively. That is to say, each damage reduction modifier will take into account any prior damage reductions before being calculated. Very similarly to the incremental value increases in power we had for each buff we applied. However, since in this instance we're talking about a stacking reduction, there will instead be an incremental loss in value for each damage reduction buff you stack on top simultaneously, reducing the overall value and effectiveness of each of the damage reduction modifiers. As opposed to prior patch 3.1 where it stacked additively and thus always reduced the damage taken by the exact amount listed. As a quick example before we move on, with 0% damage reduction, you'll take 3x50 damage from a monk leaving us with 30 HP. When we're using bark skin, 40% of 50 damage equaling 20, 20 minus 50 being 30, and bark skin only being applied after the first attack, we're left with 70 HP, all of which makes sense and is pretty straightforward. 
However, if we were playing on the Iron Breaker who has a 30% damage reduction passive, and keeping in mind that the first attack here is being negated from his passive, we would expect just adding the damage reductions together, ending up with 130 HP. However, that's not the case. In reality, what happens is that the 50 damage is reduced to 35, and then the 40% is calculated based on the 35 rather than the 50, leaving us instead with 124 HP. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about potions. Now, as you most likely already know, there are three different varieties of potions, each with their own effect. The blue speed potion, the yellow strength potion, and the purple concentration potion. And by default, all three potion types last for exactly 10 seconds after consumption, which can be increased to 15 seconds with decanter or reduced to 5 seconds with concoction but gaining all three buffs. In either case, that's a value increase of plus 50%, although admittedly there is extra value to be found from the consistency of concoction since it does nullify the RNG of which potion you happen to find due to the effect being identical with either potion. That being said, Proxy however lasts for 10 seconds but shares the entire effect with the closest ally in range, thus giving you 2x 10 seconds buff for a total value increase of plus 100%, which mathematically speaking makes it the best trait overall in terms of value. Although that being said, certain classes and builds can definitely benefit more from either of the other traits, even in the context of the whole team. But generally speaking, if you have a pre-made team of friends, roughly speaking, three quarters of you should be using proxy. But lastly, staying on the topic of potions, I thought I'd leave you guys with just two more facts and something daunting to think about. As for the facts, it's fairly well known that a speed potion grants a plus 50% movement speed and plus 50% attack speed buff for 10 seconds. Whereas the concentration potion grants a buff that increases the cooldown regeneration rate of your career ability tenfold for 10 seconds. In other words, it replenishes 100 seconds worth of cooldown in just 10 seconds, essentially putting the cooldown value of the potion at 90 seconds, assuming the default duration time. And as for the strength pot, also known as the armor penetration potion, well, that's where something daunting to think about comes in. You see, it's complicated, and no one knows. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, we do know something. We know it grants a raw power buff somewhere between plus 1 and plus 1000% and significantly increases the armor penetration of all your attacks, doubling, tripling, sometimes even quadrupling the armor damage output of a given attack, even allowing attacks that have no armor damage in of themselves to deal armor damage. As for the exact amount, however, well, it seems to vary depending on the weapon and attack you're using, and as far as I've been able to research, which includes but is not limited to the Vermintide Reddit, the Vermintide Wikipedia, YouTube videos, gaming articles, Steam guides, even asking people who mod the game in their spare time, and of course doing my own testing, and yet it still seems that no one in the community has the mechanics down to an exact science with a consistent and coherent explanation that can be explained in like a single sentence. And the closest I've gotten is, well, it varies depending on the weapon you're using. Now, just take a moment to consider that. Just, just take a moment to think about something as basic as a strength pot. And no one has a simple explanation for what it actually does. I mean, that just tells you something about how complicated it can be to make these videos sometimes. And if by any chance anyone does have said simple explanation, I will pin your comment the moment I've double checked and confirmed it. Scratch that, I'll up you one. Anyone who comes up with a simple and coherent explanation for how the strength pot works, I'll give you a personal shout out along with the uh, explanation in the next edition of this series. I, I'll gladly be proven wrong, I'll gladly learn something, so uh, if anyone has that explanation, feel free to let me know down in the comments and uh, I'll feature that in the next video. If I have gotten anything wrong, I'll be the first to admit it and I'll be the first to post the correction. So feel free to double check me down in the comments. Just make sure you have your own facts straight first before you start correcting. And, and uh, well, other than that, I just hope you guys enjoyed the video. And uh, as always, I love you guys. Stay awesome. Peace out.